So it's, it's my great pleasure to introduce a friend, uh, as well as the director of the Department of Labor and Industries, uh, Judy Shirky. We have worked with her for, for decades, uh, but for the last eight years, uh, she has been the uh, director of the Department of Labor and Industries, and she oversees uh, the workers' compensation system in this state. She oversees the uh, safety and health laws of the state and the employment standards. Uh, this woman cares passionately about making sure that our workplaces are safe and healthful for workers, for employers. With that, give a warm welcome to Judy Shirky. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Well, it's, it's my great pleasure to be here with this celebration. I see so many labor and industries folks here. I'm glad to see my colleagues here with me. We, uh, we certainly um, have a, a great interest in this event and making sure that the memories of these girls is, is resurrected and not forgotten. And thank you to everyone who has uh, restored this history. I'd like to talk just a moment about worker protection, as Jeff did. In Washington, we have a long history of recognizing the need for worker protection going back as far as our 1889 state constitution, which mandated that Washington state would have laws to protect workers. We're one of the only states in the union that has such a, uh, a feature in our constitution. Major safety laws were passed early in the last century, in 1903, and ironically, in 1911. But it was too little, too late, to protect the girls at the Imperial Powder Company. In those days, it was common for young women to work to help to support their families. But they were typically stuck in some of the worst jobs and the worst duties in the plant, with little regard for their safety or well-being. This began to change during the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire that Jeff mentioned in March 1911, when outrage swept the country and people began to demand safer, safer workplaces and to question why those, why those work activities and those working conditions were there for women. Here in Washington State, the Imperial Powder Company was our watershed event. It was the event that triggered outrage and anguish here. And it also had a very important function in that it tested our newly created workers' compensation system, which became effective October 1, 1911. Up until then, workplace injuries and deaths were considered just part of the job. The only relief for injured workers was through the courts. In many instances, the laws were set up to make it difficult for an injured worker to win such cases against their employers. For instance, the laws in many states pre prevented injured workers from recovering damages from the employer if the injury was caused by the negligence of a coworker. These challenges played out in the aftermath of the Imperial Powder Fire when some people blamed the victims. An inquest, as you know from reading the history, ruled that the employer was not at fault, although they were fined by the Department of Labor and Industries about $1,300 for violating state child labor laws by employing two girls under the age of 16. Even if the families had had the resources to sue the company, it's unlikely they ever would have collected a cent. But like I said, something else happened in 1911. Uh, the mandatory no-fault industrial insurance protections for workers in hazardous industries was enacted by the legislature. All employers in those industries were required to pay insurance premiums. And I want to tell you a little bit about what happened to the families of these girls in the aftermath. The law took effect, as I said, on October 1, 1911, <clears throat> exactly one month before the fire. And the law at that time recognized that these girls worked to support their families and that the families depended on their incomes to survive. So the families of the eight victims were awarded pensions, as they were called, of $20 a month to be paid until the girls would have reached the age of 21. The families were also paid $75 each for burial expenses, enough to cover basic funeral expenses at that time. While I'm sure the burial benefit and pensions brought some relief to these grieving families, there were challenges to the new law. The largest explosives country company in the state, DuPont, refused to pay its share of insurance premiums, claiming it was not hazardous like the Imperial Powder Company was. 
And this meant there wasn't enough money in the new workers' compensation fund to pay the pensions in the years that followed. The historical record that we looked into tells us that when there were no funds available, the department issued pension checks to the families, but also stamped them not paid due to lack of funds. A lawsuit against the DuPont company dragged on for several years, and during that time the pension checks continued to be issued insufficient funds whenever funds were not available. Now, I was relieved to learn, however, from the record that the lawsuit was finally settled, DuPont paid its share, and all of the previously issued checks were taken care of and paid to the families. The families of these girls were among the very first recipients of the new workers' compensation law, a, a feature of our society today that we take for granted. That money would have made a big difference to the families then, just as it does now when workers are killed at work. It's an honor for me, for Labor and Industries, to be part of the story today. One of the things I'd like to leave you with to tag on to what Jeff and Bob said is at the time these girls were killed, there were roughly, at the time the new law was enacted, 300 to 400 deaths a year in workers comp for workers' compensation and worker safety and health. Now there are, on average, 80 to 100 deaths a year, and granted, that is a reduction from where we were in 1911, but it is certainly not enough. And I want to ask you, when you see an article in the newspaper where a worker has been killed at work, how does that affect you? I can tell you it really affects me. Many people just go on to the sports page. But this is something that we can't accept anymore, that workers die in the course of their employment. Again, thank you very much for allowing me to be part of this ceremony and for Labor and Industries to be part of this. Thank you to everyone who is, has done such a wonderful job appropriately memorializing these girls. I know their families would be very, very grateful. Uh, and I thank you all for being here. I think this is just a beautiful setting and a beautiful event. Thank you.